Welcome to another episode of the Best You Podcast, where we teach you the healthy habits you need to look and feel like your best you. Today, we have an incredible guest, Dr. John Russin, who is one of the leading experts in pain-free performance training. In this episode, we're going to dive deep into the six essential movement patterns that everyone should be incorporating into their weekly workouts. Dr. John Russin also shares his expert advice on how to optimize your warm-up and your cool-down routines, how to strike the right balance in your exercise selection, and break through those stubborn strength plateaus. He also offers his ideal structure for a week-long training program, whether you work out two to three times a week, four times a week, or five plus times a week to help you train smarter and achieve better results. By the end of the episode, you're gonna have actionable strategies to enhance your workout routine, prevent injury, and reach your fitness goals more effectively. Before we dive in, don't forget to hit the follow button if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app or on Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button below so that you never miss an episode jam-packed with health, wellness, and fitness insights. For those of you guys I have not met yet, my name is Nick Carrier, and I'm a body optimization coach and creator of the 10-Week Transformation, which has transformed the body and the lives of over 700 people so far. The 10WT makes it simple for former athletes who struggle to prioritize their health and fitness to regain the confidence in their bodies that they once had. To learn more about the 10-week transformation or, per, or potentially even join, go to nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. For now, it's time to get closer and closer to your best you with Dr. John Russell. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast today. I am really excited to be joined by the one and only Dr. John Russin. Uh, John, been really looking forward to this. Uh, As I told you offline a while back, I took the pain-free performance specialist certification a a number of months ago, and I felt like I learned so much just in the couple of days there, and then I started to really dive deep into your stuff and uh, your content, especially on Instagram, and I feel like I've been able to uh, take a lot of what you post on Instagram and apply it myself and also with some of my clients as well. So first off, just appreciate you and the content and and the education that you put out in the world. So uh, excited to dive a little bit deeper here today in some of those things. I think I kind of want to start off by having you identify having you identify the six foundational movement patterns and why training all of them is really key for both performance and longevity. Yeah, six fun, uh, foundational movement patterns, squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, carry. These are foundational to human movement. This is what establishes an entire human movement system spectrum, meaning that what a person should be able to do after normalized development. And a lot of people ask questions about like, why these six patterns? Why aren't there seven patterns or four patterns? This follows the normalized developmental sequence. So when a baby is born all the way up into becoming an adult, these are the milestone and the keystone developmental patterns, sequences, and also positions that allow us to actually interact in the real world as adults. So a lot of people just make they go in and they lose them over time, but reestablishing them, that is one of the key principles of the pain-free performance training system. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And and today we're going to basically get into like training for longevity, especially uh, how do we train when we get older and, and also kind of removing pain or reducing chances of pain and stuff like that. And so training all of these six uh, movement patterns are really critical for that. I feel like the hinge is probably at least maybe potentially in my experience, one of the most difficult for people to like uh, nail down. Talk to me about what what are some like cues and what are some uh, best practices that you've learned that gets people into the right hinging pattern? Yeah, step one is actually being able to train a hip hinge. It is one of the most learned disused patterns of all the foundational movement patterns. I think one of the reasons is that we don't necessarily have to do it in the real world anymore, but mm-hmm. we're also has the stigma that we're maybe scared of pain, injuries, or having a negative connotation or association with what it is to deadlift or what it is to hip hinge. And people have ultimately just lost this pattern. But the cueing sequence, or at least being able to follow some sort of progression play, is going to be the thing that most people will need. Something that I don't recommend is just going, hey, you haven't hinged in 20 years. Let's go barbell deadlift a 1RM and just see how it goes. We'll go to the opposite side and we'll go, hey, how do we reestablish this pattern? 
How do we build it from the top down? How do we be able to reintegrate it with more isolation, whether a glute or hamstring based exercises and actually reestablish and teach the hips to actually be the key compounding driver of the most powerful and the strongest movement pattern that we have at our disposal. Mm, yeah, no, I, I love it. That's, that's good. And, um, kind of along those same lines when it comes to maybe the six movement patterns or what are some like muscles and exercises that you feel like people are overtraining a lot or doing too much of and then we'll hit the flip side of it after that yeah the mirror muscles man it's like the pecs the biceps the abs those are the trifecta of overtraining at PPSC, we look at the opposite side of the body. We look at strength and resilience being built on the posterior chain. Really a key focus for us is in the upper back, the ass, and down into the hamstring. So those are the key drivers of power and performance, but also they are the things that keep us aligned and healthy for life and being able to do things, not only just to stay healthy, but actually perform in the real world. Yeah, I love it. Let's let's dive a little bit deeper into that. I know that one of the things that you guys teach, especially from a uh, shoulder health standpoint, is this three to one ratio of uh, pulling exercises to pushing exercises on maybe like a weekly basis throughout your training, and then also like a two to one ratio of horizontal pulling rather than vertical pulling. Talk to us about first like the pulling to push, why that's super important, and then why the vertical to horizontal ratio, why that's important for like both shoulder health and I guess performance as well. Posture re reversal is huge today because we're spending more and more time here on Zoom calls. We're sending it on the phone, driving, sedentary, Netflixing, and chilling. A lot of our activities today are handheld technology-based, or they are just basically internally rotated, protracted, and flexed over at the spine, the neck, and the shoulders. With that three-to-one pull-to-push training ratio, we are simply trying to restore a normalized function of the entire upper quadrant. So we have like the shoulder, the thoracic spine, the head and the neck, and that entire quadrant working together in the opposite direction once again. And the reason that we do this is because we've seen that testing out all different ratios from one to one to one to two to two to two, all these different things that three to one really allows us to still make gains and not neglect any patterns or muscle groups, but allow us to be the healthiest with the general recommendation. Taking it one step further, we really want to be focusing in on pull patterns as well. That's going to be the key pattern for shoulder health. So we want to do more horizontal pulling than vertical pulling. Big reason is that when we horizontally pull something like a row, we can actually maintain a neutral shoulder position or even move into external upon the pull concentric contraction. When you're in the vertical plane of motion, if you're pulling something like a pull-up, no matter what your hand position is, upon that concentric contraction, while your chin goes up to the bar, we're going to have internal rotation at the shoulder. Doesn't necessarily mean that internal rotation is inherently dangerous. We just want to combat and restore the external rotation with the natural internal rotation that most of us are getting a lot of in our daily lives. Yeah. So essentially just, we have an excess of shoulder internal rotation. We need to kind of train that out of ourselves or, or balance it uh, by doing a lot of upper back exercise, pulling exercises and such. Uh, restoring and balancing, that's a great word because we want to be able to establish a full range of motion. That means mm -hmm. full internal and external rotation. If we're always sitting in internal rotation, then we're going to lose those tail end ranges of motion into external and it becomes our new normal. That's not awesome when you go to actually use your shoulders. So being able to restore and regain the function throughout the entire range of motion is really key there. Are you somebody who used to be confident in your health, but you've fallen out of a good routine and you're looking to regain the confidence in your body and your health that you once had? What's up, you guys? I'm Nick Carrier, and I'm a body optimization coach and creator of the 10-Week Transformation that has transformed the bodies and the lives of over 700 people thus far. And I want to tell you about the 10-Week Transformation Challenge. This is a challenge that will completely reset the way that you feel. It's going to completely change the way that you see yourself in the mirror and transform the way that you look at yourself in the mirror. We have a proven framework called the five steps to goal success. That's going to allow you to set a very specific target, a very specific goal to be at by the end of the 10 weeks. Then we're going to set weekly goals. Then we're going to have the bat most badass workouts that there are. And you're going to completely transform the way you look and feel in just 10 short weeks. This isn't just trying to look different or trying to feel different or trying to eat healthier or trying to exercise more. 
This is a plan to do it at a super high level. And I'm the best fitness coach here in Nashville, Tennessee. And if you're in Nashville, you can join today at nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. If you're not in Nashville, Nashville, we have a virtual version of the program as well that you can also find at nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. So click on that link below and you guys, you will not regret it. There's over 700 people that have done it thus far. There have been people who have done it 10, 11, 12, 13 times because they've seen such great results and just can't stop. So go nickcarrier.com slash 10WT to get started today. Yeah, I want to go into a lot of exercises that maybe we're neglecting or not doing enough of here in a second, but just kind of like, I'm curious, you know, you you mentioned postural reversal. We do a lot of sitting down and doing stuff. I know you're active because you're doing training and stuff like that, uh, maybe more than uh, the typical human being who's sitting at their desk for a nine to five, but are there like daily things that you try to do or things that you try to do in the week to like ensure that your like structural alignment are staying at where you want them to be? Yeah, uh, no doubt, uh, six phase warm up seven days a week. And that's mm. something that we really go into external rotation, extension, and abduction, not only at the upper body, but at the lower body. I'm guilty of it just like everyone else is. I'm not sitting here pointing fingers like the postural police. I sit on Zoom calls, I'm on the phone, I'm Instagramming, uh, I'm doing everything that everyone else is. But I know very well that when I go into 10 to 12 minutes a day to get ready for my training, that is a seven day a week, 365 days a year type thing that I know mm. that I can depend on to actually feel my best that day even if I've been traveling on a four or five hour flight, or if I've just been sitting for five or six hours on call. So that's something that we definitely preach at pain-free performance, but it's something that I've practiced uh, for the last 15 years or so. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who are li- like, people who are listening right now are not going to necessarily know all uh, terminology of like warm up exercises and necessarily muscle groups or whatever. So um, to the best of your ability, like, you know, people who are listening, they hear six phase warm up, they hear 10 to 12 minutes. Some people are like, okay, I can dedicate that. Some people are like, I want to do three, four, five minutes. What are some of like the most effective warm up exercises that uh, basically anybody should be doing if they're, let's just say like a full body workout? Yeah, uh, six phases mandatory for us just because we've seen such yeah. notable results and effectiveness from it. But it doesn't mean that you have to like skimp on it. 10 minutes is really all that you need. A little bit of everything, minimal effective dose strategies goes really a long way. A little bit of soft tissue work, a little bit of stretching, a little bit of corrective exercise and mobility, a little bit of activation with bands, a little bit of practicing your movements for the day, and then a little bit of twitchy work, whether it be med ball, jumps, slams, jacks, sprints, whatever it may be. In 10 minutes, you're going to feel awesome. And that's great because you can train harder that day. You can perform better that day. And the compounding factor of some of those little unsexy things will add up over time to actually push you forward in terms of your health and your performance. I love it. As a trainer, do you have, do you ever get pushback from clients who are like, I don't want to do a 10 minute warm up. I just want to get into it. Or like, what, what do you uh, say to them to be able to get maximal buy-in from, from clients uh, who are doing maybe a tip, maybe a longer warm up than they may be typically doing? I see the opposite. I see people that are told that they're inherently broken, that they have all these pains and injuries that need to be quote unquote fixed before they can go in and start strength training. I see them going 30, 40, even an hour of warmups. And you're like, hold on a second. Let's look at minimal effective dose and actually get you the same result in a fraction of the amount of time. Very rarely will I have a client or an athlete that comes to me that's like, yo, I don't want to do this warm up. At that point in time, if they're coming and working with me or any of my staff, they know very well that health is wealth, and that is a portion of staying healthy, which is your preparatory work before training. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, well, you we, you said overtrained pecs, biceps, abs, undertrained maybe upper back, ass slash glutes and hamstrings. What do you? What are um? What are some of the? You know, we mentioned rows, obviously deadlifts. What are some of the other like go to uh, essential? lower body exercises and upper back exercises that you like to do? Upper back, face pulls the king. I love face pulls. I like them from different angles, with different training tools, with different hand positions, with different lower body positions. The more face pulls, the better. It essentially reverses the exact position that you would be in if you're on your cell phone texting right now. 
And that one's a beauty. You can work that in a lot too, three, four, five days a week, even up to seven days a week, especially if you cycle between heavier days and lighter days. Maybe it's a stack on the cable and a light band. But in terms of lower body, working the glutes and the hamstrings directly is a really big ROI in terms of your training exercise selection and volume distribution. So things mm -hmm. along the lines of hip thrusts, glute bridges, hamstring curls, those really add up. Things like back extensions, those are the ones that will definitely move the needle. But you can't neglect some of those lower body movement patterns like the hip hinges. It's not just the deadlifts, but it's the RDLs, the Romanian deadlifts, being able to mobilize the hamstrings, work the pure hip hinge pattern, and then obviously move out into single leg work as well, whether that be lateral lunges, single leg RDLs. There's so many great options. The key is just finding what works for you that you can train hard, you can go heavy, you can get a stimulatory training effect, and then being able to build your arsenal of quality movements that you're confident and competent in. Mm, I love it. When it let, I want to talk about uh, doing like the barbell deadlift, for example. Is there a minimal required strength that you look for for somebody before like bringing them to a barbell deadlift or is it mainly about uh, having the proper technique from the hip hinge pattern um, because I mean obviously the barbell deadlift can go to as light as 45 pounds unless you have a, a lighter bar and goes down to like 35 pounds or so uh, but is there something I guess is there a, a prerequisite before you go into a barbell deadlift with somebody combination of uh, movement pattern and strength yeah, there's no absolute strength prerequisite for barbell deadlifting. Uh, relative strength is going to be something in the mix. You know, a 100-pound lady versus a 300-pound guy are going to have two totally different strength capacities. But I'm more worried or I'm more cognizant of being able to have the motor skills to be able to set a client or yourself up for success with the pattern. And mm. that really goes in on a progression scale of how we would build the hip hinge. You would go from an isolated hip hinge, something like hamstring curling, glute bridging, hip thrusting, into introducing something with a horizontal force vector, something like a pull through or a horizontal hip thrust. And then going in and introducing the compound pattern from the top down, meaning that you start in a neutral position, whether it be a dumbbell, kettlebells, a barbell, and you're actually going down through that extended range of motion with a neutral spine position, with the pelvis and hips that are actually translating posteriorly towards the back. And that looks really good and you're getting strong and you're getting all the gains from that. The step up from there, from an RDL top down, would be something that takes center of mass into play, which is trap bar deadlift off the high mm. handle. One of my favorite exercises that are extremely accessible for almost every single person. And at that point in time, when somebody's looking awesome, their strength metrics are going up, their form is locked in, and they're having the want to go to a barbell deadlift. That's not everybody. We don't actually go right to a barbell deadlift from there. We'll go to a barbell rack pull or a barbell block pull which will manipulate the range of motion to make it more accessible for their unique needs, body type, joint type, anthropometrics at the hips, the shoulders, and spine. And then we get to the top of that pyramid. If it is a needs or a wants thing for people, maybe they want to go in and power lift. Maybe they're just really super psyched about doing a barbell deadlift off the floor. Then we'll be able to access that having earned the right to get up to that level five. Mm, I love that. I love that progression. Um, when it comes to building strength, there's a lot of people who are on this listening to the podcast who are looking to get stronger and maybe have a decent amount of training experience. Let's just think of like a few of the a traditional like powerlifting moves, like a deadlift, a squat, uh, a bench press. If somebody has been looking to build strength and looking to incre increase their one rep max numbers and doing traditional strength rep ranges of you know anywhere from one to six let's say and resting anywhere from two to three minutes in between sets and they've kind of got to the point where i'm hitting a plateau i feel like i'm doing what i can what are like some different uh training techniques that people can use to break through a plateau with regards to some of these maybe uh strength exercises that they might be doing a one rep max for yeah let's just talk about the big three squat bench deadlift with the barbell almost every time that i see people hitting plateaus uh, whether it be a performance plateau or an injury plateau, which happens many, many times, they're doing too much of that specific exercise. Mm. Common sense would say that, hey, if you want to get good at something, if you want to get stronger at something, the rule of specificity says that you better just be barbell benching, deadlifting, and squatting. 
It doesn't necessarily work that way. Many times we'll pull back people's volumes and we'll increase their intensities on their big key performance indicator lifts, their KPIs. And we try to keep the total distribution of volume on those big barbell lifts under 10%. When I work with people that are hitting those pain or performance plateaus, many times they're at 30, 40, 50% of their total volume is coming from the barbell. That is a quick recipe to either overtrain or just get aches and pains in the non-contractile areas of the body, the joints, the ligaments, being neurologically fried and feeling like shit. So we pull back their volume and then we concentrate it very quickly on high effort, but also high intensity work. So you mentioned one to six. That's exactly how I would be training with a barbell for somebody that has earned the right to get up to that level. And with that, we would be concentrating more on the one to threes. As soon as you get into the fours, fives, and sixes, your breathing and your repeat capacity becomes a little bit tougher to manage. The one to three range there, we really just start focusing in on the breath the brace cycle, and then being able to execute with less total time under tension, but more absolute load. And almost every single time that makes people feel fresher because they're doing less mm -hmm. total volume. They're gaining the gains back because they're doing higher intensities and the quality of their work is just maintained, which is a key indication of progress. I love it. I love it. So basically making sure that you're not excessively doing that particular thing, dropping maybe down the volume and giving making sure that the volume is higher quality volume and higher intensity volume, and maybe really focusing on that one to three. Is there um, also benefits to, or like if, if you're trying to help somebody through a plateau, obviously it depends on person to person of like focusing on unilateral work, focusing on like variable resistance type work with maybe mini bands or other type of equipment. Uh, w what are some of the benefits of maybe some of these other types of strategies to breaking through some of these strength plateaus? Yeah, if somebody has a big strength goal, uh, very rarely will we just lift with a straight weight with the barbell. Uh, we'll usually undulate uh, different four-week training cycles where we'll change in the accommodation of resistance. We'll go from maybe bands week one into nothing week two, into chains week three, into reverse mm -hmm. bands week four, and then we'll go back into that week five peak and we'll be at, at free weights again. So very rarely will we be working even at that 10% of total volume with straight weight with the barbell. Also, we're not necessarily always using the barbell. I'm a big fan of being able to have more accessible specialty tools, whether it be a safety squat bar, whether it be a trap bar, whether it be a fat bar or neutral grip on the bench press, being able to actually get into slightly different positions, slightly different angles, and slight different emphases on muscle groups. Those are the things that really weak link plus. But uh, based on your question, one of the most important things is that we identify the weak links. We identify yeah. not only weak links with those lifts, but actually your strength as a human being. And we directly go after that with accessory work in the power or hypertrophy schemes. We go at metabolic stress uh, to actually build resiliency within those tissues. And many times for lower body, that's going to look like unilateral or asymmetrical stance work. And at the upper body, it's going to be able to play the angles with overhead, uh, slight angle work, and then of course, direct shoulder and upper back work. Mm, I love it. I love it. That's all great. Um, w to stick on this maybe strength component one more time is how do you view training close to your one rep max, especially as you're getting older now, because there's there some people who are listening to this and they want to challenge themselves as they get older and maybe they're mid forties, maybe in their fifties and they like still want to make strength gains. And, you know, we know that in order to build muscle and build strength, you have to be training relatively, obviously We'll talk, we, you can talk percentage if you want, but relatively close uh, to your one rep max. And obviously it's going to depend from exercise to exercise and, and the quality of movement that you have and the base of strength that you have. But I want you to kind of run with the, with the question of how do you view training close to your one rep max as you get older? Well, one of the things that we pulled people back on very quickly is not actually doing any repeat bouts that are anything above like 93% of a predicted one RM. And the reason being is I really like a pyramid scheme of being able to get up to a top end set of the day, hit your strength number, and then move on to the things that are going to build those pieces up stronger and more resilient, which is going to be your accessory work to actually bust those weak, weak links open. But 
I want to also state that age is not a disability. Oh, I'm 35 now. I have to do this. Oh, I'm 50 now. Oh, I can't do these exercises. Age is definitely not a disability. And it has very little correlation with people's functional abilities. That being said, we need to be able to be prepared uh, for the stress that is going on our system in terms of training. And we need to be cognizant of the other 23 hours of the day when it comes to strength capacities as well. That stuff can either sink you or swim you very, very quickly. So being able to actually restore, I have clients that are in their 40s, 50s, even into their 60s that are playing in the one to three RM range, and they're actually hitting form failure. The biggest thing for strength is that we're actually pushing the numbers up in an intelligent way, but we're not looking at the numbers as the singular dictation of success. We are mm. looking at quality movements with escalating load over a medium to long period of time. This isn't, hey, stack two and a halfs on the barbell, one every single week until we PR or ER. Those days are over. And especially as you're getting older into your 40s and 50s, we need to be smarter. We need to be training a little bit more intelligently because there are uh, factors of physiology that maybe aren't the same as they were when you were 20. But that doesn't mean that we need to stop stimulatory strength training. It means that we need to be monitoring our volumes, our intensities, and our movement quality. Movement mm. quality is going to be key. Being able to hit form failure, meaning that you're moving the load, but you're moving it proficiently with something that you feel good about. You're not hoisting. You're actually proficiently doing the exercise, that's going to be key. And that's the thing that will make you stronger over time as well. Yeah. Uh, to stay on the theme of age is not a disability, uh, you know, as we get older, we lose muscle, we lose strength, and we even lose power at a greater rate uh, than, any, than either of those two. Talk to us about um, the importance of doing power work, explosive work, quick, tw quick twitch type work as we get older. And what are maybe some good examples of exercises that we should be doing as we get older from a power standpoint strength and muscle mass if we're not training yeah. that's the big caveat there so if you were strength training awesome if you weren't strength training you better get to strength training because we can actually start to reverse some of these things you can build muscle as you get older you can get stronger as you get older Touching upon power, that is the first physical trait that is lost due to that quote unquote normalized aging. And that's something that many people neglect because they go, hey, I'm not an athlete anymore. I don't need to move fast. I don't need to learn how to decelerate. I don't need to move my body through space. And athleticism and power go hand in hand. Being able to build in portions in your warm up and then also in your off days from actual strength training with a barbell or dumbbells, that is going to pay off dividends for you to be able to do what you want to do, not only in the gym, but outside of the gym. But being able to train not only power on concentric, but controlling an eccentric deceleration, that's the name of the game for longevity that most people are not looking into. Mm, I love it. I love it. What are some uh, exercises that you like to run people through both from a concentric and eccentric standpoint to ensure that they are able to uh, train explosively and maintain power as we get older. Yeah, uh, functional power for us needs to be an integrated model. It's not just upper body or lower body or isolation work for a key muscle that's creating power. It's a global integration between upper, lower body with synergistic sling systems. Keeping that in mind, any tool that really taps into those synergistic sling systems, we really like kettlebells and also landmine. That takes all of our power and is able to harness it through degrees of rotation with the upper and lower bodies together. So any type of landmine or kettlebell swings and snatches and presses and cleans all of those are super awesome. Add rotation into that, break out of the sagittal plane, and you're really doing well. And any time that we can actually move our feet through space with a step, the step is really the unlocking of the ability to decelerate. Deceleration can happen at the upper body. Of course, we do that with landmines and kettlebells, especially as we go up overhead or in slight angles overhead. But when we're talking about deceleration as a protective mechanism for people, it's all about the step, whether it be step forward, step back, step to the side, step reversing into a curtsy. Those are the positions that are able to integrate. And many times people don't leave the bilateral sagittal plane in their training, and it's a huge mistake.
Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. I love it. So much great stuff there. And uh, we're winding down here on time, but I, and this next question could be a whole nother podcast in and of itself, but I still think it's uh, worth diving into just, just briefly here. When it comes to breaking up a training program for, let's say, somebody who is third in between 30 and 40 and they, um, they basically look the way they want to look like maybe they would like to lose five to 10 pounds, but they basically look the way they want to look, but they just want to continue to perform well. They want to continue to feel well. How do we, and they can, they want to continue to set themselves up for success for future health and performance, longevity and whatnot. Um, how do you break up? How do you think about breaking up a training program across like the week with including mobility, strength, power, hypertrophy, cardio, and conditioning? Again, I know this is like a huge question, but I would still like, love to hear, uh, and I know everybody else would love to hear at least a quick take on, on that. Yeah, let's talk about frequency. So if you're training two to three days per week, you can add all those six physical characteristics in, power, strength, hypertrophy, cardio and conditioning, mobility, and athleticism. Those can be trained all days, two to three days per week, and that's going to be more full body emphasis. As soon as you get up to like four days, you can start to unlock whether you want to be training upper lower pattern splits. So squat hinge lunge on two days and then push pull and some sort of grip work on the opposite days. That's a super cool way to do it. But I tend to get, if I have four plus times per week, five, six, seven plus times per week, I tend to split the strength and hypertrophy work, the more traditional strength training from the athleticism, the mobility and the cardio and conditioning. I like to use athleticism, mobility, cardio, and conditioning as restorative base secondary sessions that are lower in intensity, but that can actually restore in terms of active recovery. So that's the way that I personally split it up. A lot of my programs are set up is that if you give me four plus times per week, we're going to have strength training and we're going to have your cardio on the off days to actually facilitate better gains and strength. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Just to regurgitate that to, on the for the over four days standpoint, you have basically some strength and hypertrophy days, and then some days where you think mobility, athleticism, cardio, and conditioning all mixed in there. Yes, love it, love it. Um, I think last thing I'll maybe ask is, what is your uh, how important is cooling down? How important is stretching after the workout, mobility after the workout, breaking back into the parasympathetic system at post workout? Talk to us about that. Yeah, a little bit goes a long way. Today, we've never been more stressed in our Western society than we ever have been in uh, human history. Like we are stressed the F out. And the worst thing that we can possibly do is redline our systems with a kick-ass training session. And then 27 minutes later, without ever coming down off that peak, going into another stressful business meeting or going home to your four kids or being redlined for the rest of your day, 24 hours, 48 hours after training. That's what ends up happening to people. And then they go, man, I really feel like shit because that was a tough training session. Maybe it was, but maybe you just didn't restore your uh, recovered state before you walked out. A non-negotiable for pain-free performance is adding two to five minutes in a three-phase cool down. We go into deep parasympathetic breathing for one to two minutes. That's closing your eyes, laying on the ground in a strategic position, breathing deep. After that, we go one to two minutes on a big foam rolling area. So if it was leg day, you're going to hit your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings. If it's an upper body day, you're going to get into your T-spine, lats, and pecs. And you're going to do slow, rhythmical rolls on the foam roller. And then from there, we're going to hold a one-minute stretch, and we're going to focus in on breathing deep while we stretch these areas. And that makes people feel euphoric after. It sounds like bullshit. It sounds like, oh, man, I just want to get the hell out of there after I'm training. But the results instantaneous results. The delayed gratification doesn't need to happen. Like you feel the difference instantly. Once you do it, you'll never give up. And I learned this the hard way. Two years ago, I had a training team and I pulled out our three-phase cool down from a training block. And people instantly were just like, where is it? I need to breathe. I need to stretch. I need to do my one minute of lat foam rolling. And people were like busting down the doors on email and messenger saying, where the hell did it go? And I worked it in and it's never left since because that's the experience that people have. Uh, they depend on feeling good. And the best thing that we could possibly do for a client or for yourself is to leave the gym feeling better than when you came in. 
That's how you mm -hmm. gain consistency. And that's how you gain a physical practice that can transcend your lifestyle. Mm, amen to that. Amen to that. Well, John, this has been an absolute uh, masterclass in the quick 30 minutes that we've uh, been here together. I appreciate you sharing so much here today um, with regards to exercises that are maybe overdone, exercises that are underdone, the importance of quality movement, how to break through maybe some strength plateaus, the importance uh, of maintaining power movement into our training program, especially as we get older, um, how to break up a training program. There's so many great things here. I, I hope you guys were listening and taking notes as much as I was. Um, but you guys need to make sure you also follow him on Instagram at Dr. John Russin on Instagram. Uh, you can also go to his website, drjohnrussin.com. But seriously, go follow him on Instagram if you don't already, because uh, so many different great videos and uh, different educational posts around how to uh, properly add his training methodology into your training practice to ensure that you can unlock further performance and pain-free movement. So uh, is there any other good place that people should go learn more about you or follow you? Uh, pain-free performance is at uh, getppsc.com. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, John, this has been uh, an absolute blast and honor having you on today, man. Really appreciate it. And y'all, that's all we got. What a detailed episode. I mean, John shared some game-changing strategies for optimizing your workout routine and achieving pain-free performance. But before we wrap up, don't forget to follow the show on the Apple Podcast app and on Spotify. Like if you're listening there, stop right now, click the follow button. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below because you don't want to miss any of the future episodes that are coming out that will continue to motivate, inspire, and provide you with actionable strategies to look and feel like your best you. Here are my three biggest takeaways from John's episode. Number one, prioritize undertrained muscles like the upper back, the glutes, and the hamstrings. It's not all about how you look in the mirror. Obviously, that's part of it, but it's also about staying balanced, injury free, injury free, and feeling strong and capable. Number two, the warm up and cool down are key. I'm not gonna lie, I can be guilty on skimping on these parts of the workout, but they're key to optimize your performance and injury prevention. Add in about a 10 to 12 minute warm up and a two to five minute cool down. And then third and finally, integrate the proper exercise balance. Things like doing a three to one ratio of pulling to pushing exercises, ensuring that you have all six movement patterns covered throughout your week. Train strength, train hypertrophy, power, mobility, and conditioning. Understanding how best to integrate all of these into your weekly routine will unlock a completely new version of you. If you can do these things, then you'll continue to get closer to the healthiest version of yourself, and ultimately, you'll get closer and closer to your best. Yeah.